identify right and left when you got two. Give you a lateral view there. It's the side of your put your temples, the, the side of your head. And if you look at the other side, the mirror image, and if I hide others, just looking at the two temporal bones, that's what it looks like. Two temporal bones. <laughs> thing about it is, there's a, there's a part that sticks inside, okay? So, put it back with the others, fade it out, and kind of see how it fits in the skull there. Uh, this bone is, uh, it takes, it's going to take me a while to teach this bone. It, it's one bone and there's, um, many parts, okay? That's what it looks like all big on the uh, projector, but it's not that big. Okay, I got one here. Uh, just to give you a sense. Well, this is what we're talking about here. That's how big it is. But this bone is complicated and there's many regions. But one thing to orient yourself are the different views that I have on your coloring book. This is the lateral view. That's what it looks like from the front. That's what it looks like from the back. That's the medial view. And that's the inferior view. Okay, so the three views I use most to teach from are the lateral view, the medial view, and the inferior view. I think you can see all the surface features you need to know uh, based on those three views. But I want to start by teaching the different parts of uh, the different regions of the bone. surface features, just major parts of the bone, and then the tetris region. Okay, so the squamous region, uh, squamous means flat. So I'm going to um, just color the flat part of the bone. Just pretty much all of this up here. So includes part of that. <coughs> so pretty much this whole superior part. From the lateral view, you can see the squamous region well. From the medial view, the flat part is 
all of this. as well as all of this superiorly. Inferiorly, you can kind of see a little bit of it here. Trace it for you. Okay, so from the different perspectives, know that region. It's mostly the flat part of the bone. I mean, it's hard to tell when you're just coloring it in, but um, when you have it in the lab, just kind of make the bone match the view and then look. Make the bone match the view. Oh, okay, that's the lateral view. Oh, okay, let's see. Oh, that's, oh yeah, that's the medial view. And then look at it underneath. And make the bone in your hand match the view, because this is kind of like, hard to figure out. Um, so the squamous region is called that because squamous means flat. It's the flat part of the bone. Tympanic, it refers to function. Okay. Um, basically, simply put, it's the region where your bony ear hole is. Let me color that in. I'll use red. For squamous, I use green. <coughs> so the tympanic region where your ear hole is is pretty much. Um, <clears throat> green part, the squamous part, this little part in front of it is still considered the squamous region. So I'll go back and fill that in as green. Okay, but where I colored over, I color, colored over the ear hole basically. Okay, they call that the tympanic region. Now from the medial aspect, you can't see it. But from the inferior aspect, you can see it. Here's your ear hole right there. So I'm going to color it in this region. Hole. Okay. So you can see it from the inferior view as well. So look for the ear hole. Also, you have what's called the mastoid region. It refers to the region that contains the mastoid process. It's palpable. You can feel it. It's that bump behind your ear. And that is where a muscle called the sternocleidomastoid, it inserts there, so you can turn your head from side to side. Sternocleidomastoid, it's, it's a big long word. It's, it's one word, sternocleidomastoid. Let me write it out up here. Sterno Mastoid. It's a big neck muscle. Inserts on the 
mastery process. Uh, in the atlas, um, on page 619, for those tables that have all the O's and I's and actions, <coughs> 619, that's a, that's a major muscle of the neck that I want you to know. It inserts right here. So if it inserts on your head, you can turn your head. So what it does is it turns your head on the opposite side. So if, if I turn my head this way um, to the right, it's the one on the left that does it because I got two of them. So watch my neck. See if you can see a muscle pop out. Okay, we turn the other way. This one pops out. Okay, so it just turns your head the other way. So anyway, that's the muscle I want you to know. The mastoid process um, in the mastoid region are right here. View. From the medial view, you can't see it. From the inferior view, it's all of this. region, I'll do that next, the region of this bone, this region, um, well, Petrus means rocky. It refers to the appearance of it. It's kind of rough and jagged and it's the part that kind of projects medially. So that region is shown, I'll use orange. all that orange part. Can't see it from the lateral view, but from the inferior view, you can see it's why it's, I said it's the part that projects medially. It's all this part here. that whole orange part that's sticking in. Okay, so that coloring page was just so I could show you the regions of the bone. Now I want to go through the surface features that are listed on your study guide within those regions. So I'll erase my color and you can just flip the page.
All right, the first um, surface feature in the squamous region I have listed is the zygomatic process. The zygomatic process. So the zygomatic process, that's the surface feature of the temporal bone. It articulates with the, the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. So let me write that out. The zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Articulates with temporal process of zygomatic bone. So the processes are named for the bones they articulate with. And together those two processes form um, the temporal arch. App to show that to you real quick. So I just have those two bones highlighted. <coughs> the cheekbone is the zygomatics, as I said before. So the let's see, hold on. temporal arch, the zygomatic arch. We'll change that. Well, anyways, see this bar going forward? That's the zygomatic process because it's articulating with the zygomatic bone. So that part sticking out that way on the zygomatic bone is the temporal process. Okay, but that whole thing is the zygomatic arch. Well, back to this, this is um, easy to spot. Just color this part here red. That part sticking forward. Is it zygomatic process? Lateral view, you see a bit sticking out here. That's it right there. Um, from the inferior view, you can see it good. That's it. Moving on. You have the mandibular fossa. The mandibular fossa. A fossa is a depression, and um, this depression receives the mandibular condyle. If 
you want to study in more detail, uh, look on page 600 for TMJ. For you, you just got to know what forms are doing. The fossa, mandibular fossa, and mandibular condyle. Obviously, it's a condyle on the mandible. Okay. Uh, for now, I'll show it to you on the skeleton, on the app. Identify bone, temporal bone. There's your mandible. Okay, so if I take those two, that one, that one, go around the other side, take that one, explode. You kind of see how it articulates, right? So you need to know this. When you work with the skulls and you put them back, put the mandible on back right. Because you know where it's supposed to go, right? I mean, so based on what I just taught, I'm going to get my pointer. So if I point to this, what would you call it? It's depression. Mandibular fossa. With the thing sticking up in it, that's a condom. Condyle will stick up uh, as the fossa receives it. So that's the joint, that's TMJ. Uh, let me show you the mandibular fossa. I try to draw a little depression right here, something that appears to be a depression. So look for it. Okay, it's much more obvious when you have a little bone in your hand. Oh yeah, that's a depression. Uh, okay. Mandibular fossa. Uh, next up is um, the external acoustic meatus. I just called it your ear hole earlier. External. Acoustic meatus. Let's call it your bony ear canal. That canal leads up to the tympanic membrane, uh, hence the name tympanic region. membrane is a it's like a taut drum head and when sound waves strike that tympanic membrane it vibrates at whatever frequency of sound that's reaching your ears it vibrates these auditory ossicles which are uh, bones by the way inside your inner ear and well, I'll teach that when I get to get to ear but anyways for now just know the ear hole find it on the bone it's uh, here, a lot of it's best seen right there. Okay. That's, your, that's your bony ear hole. Can't see it from the medial view. You can see it a little bit from the inferior view. I, I try to draw it in right, right around there. Okay. Sometimes books call it external um, acoustic meatus. Sometimes they call it external auditory meatus. I, I do see other names, but that, that's the one I tend to use. External acoustic meatus. 
Um, the next surface feature I already did, it's the mastoid process. I already described that. Um, I'll color it in anyways. I'll use orange. So if I'm going for just the process and not the whole region, I, I would put it like if for a lot of practice, I'll put the sticker right on the part that sticks down like that. Okay. Right like that. Can't see it from the medial view, from the inferior view, it's this little bump right there. behind your ear that you can palpate, the mastoid process. In the petrous regions, um, it's complicated. It's very important. Uh, there's a couple of um, holes that allow major blood vessels to exit the head. There's jugular foramen and carotid canal. Jugular fossa or form. If you see, um, if you have the bone disarticulated, you're not going to see a hole. But what you'll see is a little depression where the hole would be. So then, if it's disarticulated, call it the jugular fossa. But if it's in the skull, Look where that depression is, and you'll see it. It makes a hole with the bone that forms next to it. Okay, I mean, I know you can't see in the back there, but that's why it leaves this distinction. It's a hole when it's articulated in the skull. It forms a foramen when it's next to the occipital bone in the skull. It's that foramen. The internal jugular vein exits here. IJV for short. Major vein of the neck. It drains your your big noggin, your whole head. <laughs> I'll say it drains the brain, literally. Returning spent blood from head back to the heart. And uh, now let me show you that. What's the vein called? Is it just called? Um, you mean this here? Yeah. So when, when I say forms of foramen, call it jugular foramen. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. okay. I see what you're saying. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, let's go skull. Want to isolate the skull? others. So I got the skull by itself. We're going to look at an inferior view here of the skull. I have highlighted the temporal bone. Sticks in is what region? 
Petrus region is occipital lobe. Do you see that depression right there? Okay, that is the jugular fossa. It's a depression. But when it's next to the occipital bone, that's a hole. Okay? Students always confuse this hole with that hole. The hole I'm teaching now is the jugular foramen. The one I'll teach next is the carotid canal. I want to show you the uh, IJV coming out of there. Turn veins on. Oh, the heart's in the way. Tell me why. There you go. So anyways, do you, do you see that blue tube coming out of the hole? That's IJV. So in terms of, I told you it's returning blood to the heart. <coughs> so which way is blood flowing, up or down? Down. Man, you see the heart being down there. The major vein is IJV. The major artery is the carotid, um, common carotid. Which are the arteries? Okay, I highlighted an artery in pink. Do you see it coming out of that hole? So what I'm going to teach next. Uh, this is the carotid canal. Kind of goes in there and pops out there. That blood vessel is the internal carotid artery. Enters the skull to supply blood to the brain. So the feature on the bone is the carotid canal. Let's write that down. Carotid canal. The internal carotid artery enters here. I use um, enters and exits when I talk about blood vessels in reference to how blood is flowing. Okay. Blood is flowing out of the head. So that's why I say IJV exits, because blood is on its way out. So arteries pump blood to organs. So I say this blood vessel, it enters here because it's delivering oxygen-rich blood to the brain. So notice that um, the internal carotid artery ICA for short, is the artery that runs with the IJV. So th those are the major arteries and veins of the neck. Okay. Um, turn on muscles. That big boy, sternocleidomastoid. Okay, now I wanted to show that to you because that's actually a landmark to locate your carotid. You can take your carotid pulse. If you feel just medial to your big neck muscle, right there, you can take your carotid pulse. So the. Um, the sternocleidomastoid is a good landmark to locate those vessels. All right, so let me go back to the coloring here. So let's learn product canal and jugular fossa on this. I'll use this pinkish color here. You can see it best from the in inferior view. It's this depression right there. And you can't really 
really see it anywhere else. Well, anyways, the hole right next to it is the Karate Canal. I use this brownish color to highlight it. Right here. The artery, it entered there and it popped out this hole here, so part of it. Okay, so that's karate <coughs> um, Both Both seen from the interior view. Okay. Can't really see it anywhere else. Uh, moving on, we have uh, the internal acoustic meatus. We have a temporal bone on the stand, and it's been sectioned open so you can see um, how the auditory ossicles are in there. It's pretty cool. Um, so I want you to know this is available too. I'll leave it here for you. I'll put it back on the shelf later. That's a real one. Okay, anyways, the internal acoustic meatus. Uh, Frequently missed on exams. So you guys seem to have trouble with this one locating it. It's on the Tetris region. Let me just show you where it is right here. I'll use um, any other colors. This purplish color. It's right here, medial view. Look for it. Right there. Look for a little hole right there. And that's pretty much the only place you can spot it. <coughs> Internal acoustic meatus. A cranial nerve exits there. Cranial nerve uh, 8 and 7. CN7. Facial nerve. CN8. Vestibular cochlear. They both exit the internal acoustic meatus. And uh, that, that's a theme we're going <coughs> to keep on talking about. Things exiting. The cranial nerves are part of your peripheral nervous system. They start on your brain, brain stem. And for them to get to their destinations, they need to exit the skull. <laughs> so they need a way to get out. So it needs to know that. Uh, identification it seems to be a problem. Um, look for this uh, on the superior view cranium review slide. We'll go back a few slides here. No, I'll just go back to this one. Let me pull the shade down. If you want to turn back and make a leader line, when you look at this view, it's right there. This is, this is the temporal bone, a little hole right there. That's usually where I tag it. And like you guys have a problem with that one. I don't know why. The Mr. Skull, look, look at this view. Oh yeah, that hole right there. I recognize the Petrus region. 
I'm going to do the thing you hate most. I'm going to add something to your study list. That way, process. I don't see it on there. I think I know why I removed it. It's a very fragile process. And on our picture, it's just about. <laughs> I'll use blue again. It's this little thing sticking up right there. It's this little thing sticking down right there. And it's this little thing sticking down here. Since I'm adding it, um, I'll tell you what, I'll make it a bonus. If I ask you this one, it'll be a bonus if you get it right. I know why I took it off. You guys always break them off. Like they're all broken, they're not there. And I think I got so annoyed with it last year, I said, I'm just removing it. Well, I'm adding it back, because you're probably not, I don't see it here. I don't see it here either. You guys keep breaking them off. I just look for it. So it's a bonus if you see it. See if it's on Mr. Skull here. So on the inferior view, you cannot see it, or is it the arrow? Oh, it's this blue one right there. That little spike. Maybe that's why I removed it, because they're all broken off in every single one we have. Look for it. Should be there with some of them. And um, I have middle cranial fossa. Um, I taught anterior and post posterior cranial fossa. I'll, I'll save that one for when I, when I teach the brain. I have a good slide on that. I just want to move on to the next bone, the sphenoid. slide on it. Look at the brain slides. They're all there. You'll see what I mean. The first uh, surface feature on sphenoid is the cell cursica. Uh, somehow this always makes it on the test. It's my favorite one. It's a little depression. Well, the word means Turkish saddle. That's what it looks like. And one of these days, I'm going to Google Turkish saddle, see what they really look like. But anyways, the name of the structure means Turkish saddle. Um, it's a space for the pituitary. The pituitary sits in this little depression. Sella Tursi. 
center. You can see it in our views here, anterior and superior. I'll use red. On the superior view, it's right in here, this depression right in there. So when you get your sphenoid bone and look at it in the skull too, so oh yeah, I can see that, right? Yeah, I can see that. Okay, it's, it's fairly obvious, I think. Even though it's not a very big structure. It's where the pituitary sits. After that, you have the uh, greater wings and lesser wings. Greater wings. I'll call them blue. The bone kind of looks like a winged bat, and it's just the big wings. So I'm going to color all of this. side and I'll just color in the wing on this side. That whole part, call it the greater wing. And from the superior view, you can kind of see it here. It's a big part of this bone, basically, the greater wing. Okay, it's kind of a cat miss for this bone. There is a, a lesser wing as well. You have greater wings, lesser wings. View, you got the best view of the lesser wing. It's all this wing right here. <laughs> all that traced in green. Lesser wing. From the anterior view, you can see that lesser wing sitting on top. Right here. say is part of the greater wing is the back of your eye orbit. So where I try to faintly draw something in there as part of the greater wing, that's the back of your eye orbit where I trace it in in black. The eyeball sits on there. Part of the uh, greater wing forms posterior eye orbit. Uh, let me show you that on the app. So 
going to go over here, turn the app back on, let me turn off all these things. I have highlighted the sphenoid bone, so just look into my eyes. See the part that's the back of the eye orbit? That's what I'm talking about, okay? So part of the greater wing forms the posterior eye orbit, this part right there, okay? Well, I have it here. The next thing on the study list is the superior orbital fissure. jagged, narrow passage hole. It's right here. This fissure right there. Okay. There's a lot of uh, cranial nerves that exit there. And what do you think those cranial nerves serve? What's missing? The, the eyeball? Um, so, yeah, let's kind of list them. So, you should know cranial nerve, Not two, three exits there, uh, four exits there, a branch of five, call it V1, and six. All those cranial nerves have some kind of eyeball function, I'll get to it later, but they all exit here. Kind of see it. I'll use this pinkish color. On the anterior view, it's a little fissure right in here. And when I'm shading in pink, it's the fissure. It's easier to spot when you have the bone in your hand. It's pretty obvious. Okay, moving on. That fissure, well, there's also a bunch of other little holes. Oh, I should I skip one? I skip optic canal. Let me go back and do optic canal. That's an important one. Uh, cranial nerve two, optic nerve. Exits here. Goes right to the back of the eyeball. This is for the sense of special sense of vision. And uh, anyways, the canal. I'll use orange to highlight it. You can see it easily here. It's right, there's a little hole right there. There's a little hole. Right there, I can't really see it the way I've drawn it here. Um, but that's where you look for these, where you do these two little dots, just kind of underneath the lesser wing. That's how the nerve is exiting the skull. Good thing to do when you study um, foramen is with a partner, take a pipe cleaner and just kind of make it go through there. Oh yeah, uh, it's going through, oh here's a fissure, yeah. Okay, it's big enough to accommodate it. It's going out there now. And that's a lot of activity you can do. Um, okay, moving on. Well, there's three little holes foramen spinosum, rotundum, ovale.
Riemann spinosum. Riemann. Maybe I should do them. How do I have them listed? Okay. Little tandem. Riemann valve. O-V-A-L-E, O-Valley. And, um, well, they're important enough to mention there are important structures that go through each of those. For the frame and spinosum, the middle meningeal artery enters there. Uh, for the frame and rotunda, The second branch of cranial nerve five exits there. <coughs> Call it V2. And for Raymond O'Lally, um, the third branch of cranial nerve five exits here, V3. Spinosum, a super small hole right there. Oops, got right color. Foramen spinosum. The foramen rotundum is right here. In green. I skipped foramen ovale, but I use orange for that. It's shaped like an oval. That's the easiest way to identify it. So the one shaped like an oval is foramen ovale. So it goes spinosum, ovale, rotundum. And so look for those three holes. Way to see it. Uh, you can see one of them from the anterior view, the foramen rotundum. From the anterior view is right here. So I'll use that same green color. Right there, right there, from the anterior view is foramen rotundum. So what I was just doing to confirm myself is I just I took it here and I just stuck it through when I saw how it came out the front. Oh, okay, yeah, that's it. Uh, I wanted to show you some of these things entering and exiting um, on the app. Hold on a second. I made some uh, screenshots yesterday. V is cranial nerve 5, okay. and 2 and 3 are like the branches of that nerve. Yeah. I'll reteach them when I do the cranial nerves. Okay. Well, for example, that's trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. Uh, 
try to hold put some lights on for you. Well, I wanted to show you that um, this is trail number five. But do you see how there's three branches, V1, V2, V3? There's V1. We already noted that. That's exiting the superior orbital fissure. Here is, well, can you guess if that's one? What is this? Two. Two. All right. And that exits the Raymond Rotunda. Okay. V3. That exits um, Ovalley. Okay. This blood vessel is the middle meningeal artery, and it's entering uh, for Raymond Spinosa. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you with that. Just, you know, get a sense of... There's one more, one more screenshot. Then we the Turkish side. This is showing you half of the brain stem. I'll highlight one thing there. Uh, okay. Uh, this depression, the Turkish title was cell tersica. So what gland is that? Pituitary. Huh. There's optic canal. Therefore, what cranial nerve is this? Two. The optic nerve. All right, that's what I wanted to show you there. So sphenoid bones are very important. There's a lot of uh, important structures passing through it and sitting in it. Okay, I'll turn the lights back on. Make sure I didn't miss anything for the sphenoid. We're done with that. We're going to move on to the ethmoid. Ethmoid bone, I got cribriform plate with the olfactory foramina. So it's, it's a plate on the bone. Uh, let me advance the slide. I'll just trace it here. From the front view, you can't see it. But when you look from a superior view, you can see it. And when you have the skull, look from a superior view. And try to look. It's really small. It's right there. OK, it's really small. I'll, I'll trace it for you. Area where the cribriform plate is. Now, within that plate are these super tiny drill holes. Those are called the olfactory foramina. Foramina is a small hole, and it transmits cranial nerve one, olfactory fibers. fibers exit here. Those little olfactory fibers are going to help you smell. Olfaction is the sense of smell. Anyways, on the cribriform plate, look for the olfactory <coughs> foramina. And I'll just use black to pepper little holes here in the plate. I, I tried to draw them in. So those are the olfactory foramina, the cribriform plate. So distinguish, you know, the whole thing is the plate, but with the holes in them, just say, crib for a plate with olfactory foramina. Now, if I point to the thing sticking up, that's the crystagallum. Uh, 
the, the Cox code. Mr. Chicken, Cox Co. looks like that. Or my other student called the sharp spin. That kind of looks like a sharp spin too. Anyways, on the on the drawing, on these green, the sharp spin is sticking up here. You can see it from the superior view. I mean, it looks best from the anterior view, sharp spin. Right? That's Krista Geller. The function of it, it anchors something called um, the Falk's Cerebri. Krista Gala anchors Falk's Cerebri. Underlying Falk's Cerebri, you got to know that too. The Falk's Cerebri is dura mater that anchors the brain inside the skull. So basically, by anchoring false cerebri, you anchor the brain. Uh, let me show that to you on the app, the thing I just wrote about the folks. I have highlighted in green the ethmoid bone. See that big rainbow thing? Uh, well, anyways, this is the folks. It divides your brain in half. You have two brains, a right brain and a left brain. They function as one, but the anatomy is they're separated by faults. If you go anteriorly, that thing sticking up is the Krista Gala, and it's anchoring uh, the faults. Okay, let's move on. The perpendicular plate. Well, you know, it's perpendicular, so from the anterior view, you should be able to guess what it is. It's the plate that is perpendicular. Now, perpendicular plate, let me um, color it in. How about orange? I think sticking down is the perpendicular plate. It, it forms your, superi your superior bony nasal septum. One of the things that deviates, there's other things. Um, there's cartilage in there that they can fix. There's the vulvar bone we'll get to. Yeah, that could be it too. So be sure to write the word superior because there's inferior bony nasal septum formed by something else. And be sure to put bony because the nasal septum is also cartilaginous. But I'm not holding you responsible for the cartilage. Okay.
So I wanted to show you just on the app real quick. I want you to look inside the nodes. Tell me if you see perpendicular plate. Do you see it? Perpendicular plate inside the nodes. Point out. Are you looking at this? That's it. Here's another question. True, false. The ethmoid forms part of the eye orbit. It's true, I see it right there, inside dry orbit. Okay, so that's where it is. Uh, the next thing I want to teach is the middle nasal concha. There's little protrusions there and there that stick inside the nasal cavities, and those are part of the ethmoid. Middle nasal concha. Conchi. Conchi. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Just go with it. Conchi. And it's spelled. Um, C-O-N-C-H-A, but let's put an E on the end because there's two. Middle nasal. Conca, singular, E pluralizes it. Um, they're described as these bony turbinates. When you breathe in air, air has to kind of whistle past it, and they help break up airflow. To they aid in slowing airflow, warming air, humidifying air. Slow airflow, warm, humidify air. The air you breathe. Okay. Going back to the coloring picture on the disarticulated bone, the middle nasal concha are right here. They're kind of sticking down here, more or less, on either side. see it from the superior view. So those are all the surface features I want you to know for the ethmoid. And uh, the next bone is uh, mandible. Strongest bone of the skull, it's your lower jaw basically. Obviously, it's got teeth of lower jaw, right? It's a jawbone. And um, well, the basic parts are just the body, your chin. So the body of the mandible is pretty much
but you know, it's basically a U-shaped um, structure the body is, and forms your chin, okay, in front. Think of the shape of a mouthpiece, the shape of the body, right? Um, there's mandibular angle. Well, you can palpate your whole jaw, basically. But if you palpate all the way to the back, you know, that little corner on the back of your jawbone, that's the angle. I'll use green. I would say, like, you know, right here. That's the angle. The part of the jawbone that sticks up is called the ramus. Ramus means arm. on the other side too. It's the ramus of the band. And there's two pointy projections at the top of the ramus. They are the coronoid process and the conjular process. So look for those on the top of the mandible. Coronoid process. Modular process. Earlier I called it the mandibular condyle. Same thing. Let me write it to the way I wrote it before just so you recognize it. Mandibular condyle. If you recall, this is the thing I said forms T and J. For the other one, coronoid means crown, like a coronation. So it's the one that's pointy, shaped like a crown. That's an important attachment point. Temporalis muscle inserts on the coronoid process. That's how, that helps chew temporalis. muscle. I'll just show you on the app. You ever see someone like a shaved head and they're chewing their food and you see like the side of their head kind of bulging? It's that muscle. So temporalis muscle helps close the jaw. Um, look up that muscle, you gotta know it. For now let's note coronoid process and conjugate process. <coughs> I'll use um, about that purple and pink color here. So for the orange, um, or I'll use orange and pink. Orange, I'll use uh, the corduroy process here. This part sticking up here, corduroy process in this orange color. The other one, the pinkish color, the condylar process. Right there and right here. Anyways, um, there's a little piece of bone here. This is the mandibular fossa. 
this right here. Remember, this joint is TMJ. So know that one, know the condyle and um, the coronoid process. Let's see, what else do I got here? Alveolar process. It's that ridge of the jawbone that has the tooth sockets. It's called alveolar process because um, alveolar means kind of thin, airy bone. Anyway, this part of the jawbone has tooth sockets. When I colored in the body, I kind of left that top ridge uncolored. How about I use green again? Right, just, I'm just going to color in right where the teeth are. I'm coloring on the other side too. Just the ridge where the teeth are. So if I put a piece of tape right at the top where your teeth go, that's the alveolar process. And if you have mandible, some teeth in, some teeth out, look where the teeth are not there. You can see, oh yeah, alveolar bone, okay, just to get a sense. Um, got some holes there. The mental foramen and mandibular foramen. to the mandible or is it with the uh, maxilla? The alveolar process? The alveolar process yeah. also has, um, is also on maxilla because the maxilla have your upper teeth, the mandible has your lower teeth, so both those bones have alveolar processes. Oh, okay. Yeah, good point. So it, it's a double. So whenever you have a, a double in anatomy and you're trying to show me what you know, it will be good if you put alveolar process of which bone? Mandible, because they also have it in maxilla. All right, so you have mental foramen and mandibular foramen. mental foramen, there's a nerve that pops out of there and it helps you feel your lower jaw. Um, I'll explain the nerve later, it's kind of complicated, but uh, nerve exits here to help feel lower jaw. Let's remember our, our functions of nerves is that motor or sensory, feel. Sensory. The mandibular foramen, well, let me bubble in mental foramen first. How about orange for mental foramen? Right there. Hole right there. You have one on either side of your chin. So I just bubble in the one we can see. The mandibular foramen also transmits the nerve. It's going to run inside the jawbone. Let's see. For now, I'll just say nerve enters here. It's 
It's going to help you feel your teeth. So if you have a toothache, that, that's the nerve. Um, you need to know the names of the nerves. I don't want to get into it now. But anyways, that little hole, look for it on the inside of the ramus. You can see it on one side here, right there. Mandibular foramen. Mandibular foramen, not to be confused with mental foramen. Isn't there a Greek statue of the guy's going like this? What, what's the name of that statue? Yeah, um, the thinker. They use the word mental for the chin because he's touching his chin. He's thinking, he's deep thought, mental. So I think that's where it came from. check my study list and that is all the stuff for me. The upper jaw is next. This is usually where I give a break, but I'm going to power through and finish the skull. And what I'll do for Friday is no lecture, no quiz. I'll just make the whole time lab study in preparation for Friday. I think that'll be better. So allow me to finish. We'll do upper jaw next, maximum. So as, as was pointed out, you have alveolar process for the upper jaw, just like you do the lower jaw. Or just call it alveolar process. Okay. Um, palatine process. This forms uh, the bony roof of your mouth. You have hard palate and soft palate. This forms the anterior two thirds of hard palate. So to see the um, hard palate, just look underneath and hear your view. Okay, oh yeah, there's a little plate right there. And so um, that is right here. You have two maxilla. I'll just draw the pa uh, palate process on one. One in, obviously, you have the other side too for the other maxilla bone. So 
that is palatine process, referring to palate, the roof of your mouth. Okay, you have zygomatic processes. Articulates with zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone is going to articulate there. We've seen zygomatic bone before, and we've seen another zygomatic process. So those can be confusing. Let me show you on the app. Three bones highlighted. Identify bone. Maxilla. Maxilla. What's your cheekbone again? Zygomatic bone. What's this bone? Temporal bone. Okay. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. This is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. But my maxilla also has a zygomatic process. So you have zygomatic process of maxilla articulates with zygomatic. You have zygomatic process of temporal bone, also articulates with zygomatic. Let me explode that. So all, all those three bones articulate together. So the, what we just did was the zygomatic process of maxilla. All right, it's right there. Okay, let's move on. There's a nerve that exits here that helps you feel upper jaw, middle face. Helps feel upper jaw. So when I get to the cranial nerves, I'll name all the nerves. Anyways, now just focus on the Finding that hole, easy to see. It's right below your eye orbit. I'll use blue here. We can see it on this picture, right there. Look for orbital four. Just look for it right there. We move on. Next bone is the palatine bone. Now, the palatine bone, I mean, if you look at it from the anterior view, they kind of like have an L shape, two L's that face in, and they fuse in the middle. L, L. Anyways, if this is the anterior view, if you look underneath, 
So they call the part that's in the horizontal plane, they literally have, call that part of the bone the horizontal plate. And where it is in the skull, the horizontal plate forms the posterior one-third of the bony hard palate. Forms posterior. One third of bony hard palate. Okay, so anyways, the, the horizontal palate. Oh, it's blue. The horizontal plate of the palatine bone, right here. So let me show you those bones uh, in the skull using the app. They're highlighted just like they're shown on your coloring book. I highlighted both palatine bones. And that's the interior view. Let's look at it from the anterior view. Can't see them. So if I fade others, you can begin to see the palatine bones with um, the fade out feature. There's a part that goes horizontal, there's a part that sticks up. The part that's horizontal is the horizontal plate, that's what you got to know. But the part that sticks up, it's called the perpendicular plate, but it's not in your study list, don't worry about it. Let me hide others. So you can see the palatine bones by themselves. Very, they're very small. All right. Okay, moving on. The palatine bones. Next is the lacrimal bones. I'm going to flip the page. Yeah. Cross it out and put horizontal. We'll do that. <coughs> so let me make sure that's clear. Change. Add horizontal plane. one, subtract one, that makes it even. So no complaints. All right, the lacrimal bone. Oh yeah, so I kind of zoomed in on some of the previous coloring pages so we can kind of get a better look. I mean, really, the smaller bones are best by first studying the colored skulls to get a sense. But to give you an idea, the small lacrimal bones, I'll just tell you where to look for them. Medial eye orbit. I use this 
Turkish color. So on the close-up view here, uh, let me uh, look at my original, I don't want to color it all, let's see what I'm look at something real quick. Yeah. approximation of where lacrima bone is on my crude drawing. From the anterior view, you can see lacrimal bone as this sliver right there. That's where to look for lacrimal bone. All right, the next bone, nasal bone. Now the nasal bones aren't in your nose. Your nose is cartilage, but they form the bridge where your nose hangs off of. It's where you rest your glasses. <laughs> form bridge of nose. <coughs> I'll use blue. From the profile view, we can see one nasal bone right there. In the anterior view, we can see both. I'll just trace one. And the other. Those are basically your nasal bones. But notice that maxilla They kind of go up in between. There's maxilla in green. Okay, so all, all really close to each other. Um, the next small bone listed as part of the facial bone are the zygomatics. The cheeks, the cheekbones. I'll use uh, orange here. We've talked about the zygomatic a lot. They're right here. I tried to trace it in a way so that this region here, you can kind of see how it's forming part of your eye orbit, okay? the maxilla. But also, it's just known as your cheekbones. Um, moving, oh, I'm sorry, um, the zygomatic bones, cheekbones. I think I misspoke when I said uh, maxilla. All right, um, just a couple more. Inferior nasal conchi. Inferior nasal conchi.
There's middle nasal conchi, those are the, of the ethmoid, but these are their own bone. And look for them inside the nasal cavities. From the front view, they, they're not very noticeable. Um, Red. Right here. These things sticking inside the nose there. Inferior nasal conchi. Not to be confused with the middle. The middle nasal conchi are of the ethmoid. I'll call them a different color. Uh, using this brown color. That's middle. I won't write it on the board because it's already in your notes. Okay, but since I got brown and the middle nasal conchi are of ethmoid, the perpendicular plate, I'll color brown here. I just want you to remember all that stuff colored in brown, middle nasal conchi, perpendicular plate, inside the nasal cavities, that's basically ethmoid. So the inferior nasal conchi are a different bone. Another bone inside there is the vomer. Basically, I'll, I'll use a contrasting color. Orange, I think, will work fine. It's this bone sticking up right there. It's fusing with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, forming the bony nasal septum. That's one way you could see Vomer from the anterior view. However, there's, a, there's another way you can see it, and it's a better way to see it, is from the inferior view. So for this view here, Look at the inferior view of the cranial base. The vomer is sticking out right there by the hard palate. That's the vomer. That's probably the best way for me to tag it is right there. It just kind of sticks out on its own. So again, what we're looking at is inferior view, mandible removed. Look for the vomer right there from the back. trying to give you a better sense of uh, the perpendicular plate and vomer using the app. I have vomer highlighted. I want to hide others. Vomer means plow. There's vomer by itself from the side view. Someone thought it looks like a plow. Um, it's a single bone. Let me go back. Mm -hmm. Let me do multi select.
So here's the bony nasal septum. And um, what you need to be able to identify is uh, the vomer. We identify this bone on top here. Ethmoid. That's in the eye of it. That's the crystigalli. That's the perpendicular plate. So see how the bony nasal septum is kind of caved in and there's a space missing here? Uh, there's cartilage there that finishes off the nasal septum. Then your nose is in front of that. My wife got her face smashed in by a softball. She was a teenager and she told me I had to reconstruct all of that. I couldn't tell. She had a really good surgeon. Uh, anyways, that's the bony nasal septum. I just wanted to give you a better sense of the over. That finishes the skull. So the skull is no small task to, to master. When you come back from break, you'll have the rest of the time of lab today and all day Friday just for lab time. I'll see you in 15 minutes.